sessions I've sat through in a long time. So I hope you're all energetic. If you need to stretch your arms to breathe, do, because I do. Oh my goodness. Um, so thank you for coming to this session. Thank you to the, all the participants and speakers for being on time. Uh, my name is Olivia Bina. I am from the University of Lisbon, and I also have the honor of being a fellow of the World Academy as of a very few months. Um, mm. So I would like to open up. So I need to give you a brief presentation, if I understand from my perspective, and then give the floor to the four speakers. You all have 10 minutes, and uh, as if you stick to the 10 minutes, I hope we can have some Q&A. Uh, so let's try very hard to do that. I may need a mobile phone for timing. I'll do that later. So first, uh, let me start by saying something about not this PowerPoint. This is a web page, because I don't have a PowerPoint a either. Yes. So it's a web page of, a, of an EU-funded network that I um, managed for four years called Intrepid. Very good name. I recommend it for anybody who has to work for four years on something. Um, and the reason why it's relevant to this session is that this was a four-year endeavor to look into interdisciplinarity, by which I mean the uh, various levels of integration of different disciplinary knowledges, paradigms, methods, and theories. Uh, I say that because the term has been misinterpreted almost, and almost every time it's spoken. Now, what is interesting about this for today, I think, is that I'd like to just tell you the journey in, in a few minutes. We started off and we won the funding because we asked a simple question. We asked, how can we increase the effectiveness of EU research by increasing the amount of interdisciplinary research we're doing? That simple question just showed how naive we, were, we all were uh, at that very moment in time. We were basically looking at how to do that and how to get more money out of the EU to fund international inter interdisciplinary research. Within a few months, we expanded our scope from inter to transdisciplinary research, which was mentioned today, but I'd like to define that too. By transdisciplinarity, I mean the collaboration between academics of all sorts uh, and everybody else <laughs> out there who is, uh, has the legitimacy to produce knowledge but is not considered a scientist. Um, that became clearly an essential part of producing knowledge for the 21st century. So expanding to that, we then moved on in our reflections and we came to the conclusion, lo and behold, that the problem mainly lied back into universities themselves. So it wasn't really a problem of science policy and science funding. The problem was very much back home about how academia functions, how it sees itself, how it understands itself, and its mission to produce knowledge. So the last two years of our endeavor moved on to look at what is the future of universities. And that's what we did for a couple of years. Uh, we, went, we ran workshops and so on. And I want to summarize in the last five minutes I have what those two years delivered. Um, um, essentially, we started off by claiming that, with obvious exceptions, universities have been part of the problem. Whilst this is a simple statement, the implications are wide, large, and deep. What we meant by this is that, to simplify, uh, given the time, there are two ways that universities have been and continue to be part of the problem. The problem being, sorry, I should have said that at the beginning in case it's unclear, sustainability or the lack of sustainable futures and therefore the lack of future as far as human beings at least are concerned. 
So in two ways we contribute to the problem. The first is that by and large the knowledge production in the academic institutions is to serve growth. We are machines for economic growth. And you don't have to look very far to find evidence of that. That kind of knowledge production is built and, and uh, thrives on very narrow epistemological theories and assumptions and systems. The second way we are part of the problem is that we tend to focus on system change in a narrow way. So we tend to look at the what some of the speakers today already have talked about, the inner and the outer, the two dimensions. And in academia, we tend to look very much at the outer systems and very little at the inner part. You obviously are one of the speakers I'm thinking about. So we ask basically a question, how can universities contribute to build and nurture a sustainable present and future where all life can thrive, this sentence is important, by which I mean what everything that ecological economics stands for, for example, uh, assuming a central role in sustainable transformation of our dominant socioeconomic systems. So we, we move to a quite a more complex question than the one we started. And I will finish um, with just highlighting the six um, I call them six steps in a journey because they're not steps as in one to six and you follow them and you've got the answer. They are the six elements of a journey that we are still working on and, uh, and I think we will continue for quite some time and which I hope are relevant to some extent to our topic today which looks at contextual knowledge and how to bridge between disciplines for relevant and effective learning. So to cut a very long story short, we have six things that we would like to explore and, and share with as many people as possible. The first thing that we felt was really important and has already been touched upon today. In fact, all of the things I will say have been mentioned one way or another somewhat implicitly, but uh, some of them explicitly. Our first point, our first step, was that universities must become again a place of where you question and you expose, by which we refer to the whole agenda, the vast agenda of frames of references that are being used, and the assumptions and the worldviews that underpin knowledge production, knowledge use, and what is then translated into policy making. Anybody who works on climate change will probably know exactly what I mean. There is a lot that is unconsciously held as assumptions and worldviews. That level of unconsciousness is extremely um, problematic to come to solutions. The second point and the second step is that we would like universities to become a place of maximum leverage. And here we are building, of course, on the theories of Janella Meadows and her system of leverage points to change systems. By maximum leverage, I'm referring to what she calls the three last points, which are changing goals, changing paradigms, and, trans um, and transcending paradigms. Now, this is a vast agenda for some institutions like the universities, uh, but we felt that given the challenges of the century, this was at the very little, the very least we could do as institutions of knowledge production. And here, just to touch upon some of the agendas, we're talking about the diversity of epistemolo epistemologies as an essential basis. Uh, the need to promote inner transformation, what I was referring to at the beginning as one of the problems, being part of the problem. So all the self-reflection, the, the need to have higher levels of self-consciousness uh, in the production of knowledge and so on. 
The third point, uh, I will only talk about the first three in, in any detail uh, for the sake of time. The third point is a massive one, uh, which we've labeled as universities should become a place of transformative knowledge, uh, sorry, of transformative learning and of knowledge production, transformative knowledge production. And here, building on the vast literature and theory and thinking about transformation and transformative learning, we would like, we, will pl we, we offer uh, as an idea the playing between the know-how and the how to know. Schumacher in 73 wrote uh, eloquently about the, the limitations of the know-how and the need for the how to learn, how to know. And in fact, he went on to an even more simple and important point, to know what matters. Um, and we have explored and are exploring this whole agenda, um, offering, again, the need to embrace inter- and transdisciplinarity as one of the elements of this, the need to explore embodied knowledge, something completely out of the ordinary for institutions of academic uh, style, um, the need to have less conformity and more diversity and a license to fail, which is, again, far too um, absent in academic pursuit and knowledge production. Anybody who's familiar with the whole publication arena will know what I mean. Um, and finally, the need to expose frames of references, of course, but also pursue a, s a range of competences which have been mentioned briefly in other presentations. Uh, but of course, one of them is self-awareness and self-knowledge. Uh, I can't remember who ended up with the Socratic reference <laughs> this morning, but it, it made me think that there was a link there. Um, the whole agenda of inter, intra and interpersonal uh, competences and skills. Um, and, a cert and a renewed focus on the human potential as the ultimate driver of change. And here, I don't have time to elaborate because I'm already one minute beyond schedule, uh, but I am reflecting to some of the issues that have been raised about artificial intelligence. And in our, uh, in our reflections on the role of university and the role of science and, and research, we find that the bias of thinking in terms of solutions, in terms of socio-technological solutions as opposed to human potential and technology as service, that balance needs to be at least much more in focus, if not much more a priority of the research agenda. The last three points would be a place for civic engagement, a place to envision sustainable futures, and finally, the universities themselves will need a whole system change. And UNESCO has worked a lot on them, and we are nowhere near target. So that's the whole agenda of Education for Sustainable Development, for example. So those are the six steps that we proposed um, in terms of looking into the future of universities and what, they, what that future might entail if sustainability matters. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm um, yeah. yes. Uh, please uh, let me uh, let me switch this off uh, uh, because it's really annoying to have someone else's images staring. Oh, this is even uglier, isn't it? Okay, let me. You have noth nothing here, right? So, no. well, if I do this, will it? Yes, no. lovely. The microphone. Okay, the mic. Yes. Cultural and scientific models have been changing for centuries, whimsically and often following the dictates of so-called <laughs> scientific truth. In our era, following the reign of terror of chemical formulas, scientific thought has come under the sway 
of a whole succession of new models that are actually old ones. What are the ways of bridging differences and the whole heritage of scientific reductionism with its compartmentalized, narrow, and mutually exclusive scopes of research? Let me explain. Humanities and social science disciplines are complicated creatures. They are not just intellectual fields of inquiry, they are also organizations and cultures. One could make an argument that the production of knowledge in capitalist modernity was predicted on the break between two cultures. It's an, it's an evergreen, of course. Science imagined as a search of truth through research and philosophy concerned with speculation and moral laws. This separation implied a very clear division between the search for what is true and the quest for what is just. One of the first liberatory epistemic premises, in my view, would be to reunite the field of knowledge by transcending, as you said, transcending this artificial epistemic separation. As we enter the 20th century, the tripartite organization of university between humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences was well in place. Social sciences emerged an impenetrable fortress separated by organiza organizational culture of mutual distrust. As we are entering a period of systematic instability, evidence that not only in crisis of economy but also in the crisis of the state, we should refuse to perpetuate the liberal organization of knowledge and state-centered science. There is nothing particularly revolutionary in this suggestion. After all, social sciences are constructed visions, visions of the world, and it's, it's only natural for them to be reconstructed. What is important in this task is to avoid the trap of interdisciplinarity, an ambiguous word, I would say, that was used already in 1920s. And that today goes under different names, including multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and probably many others. The idea is not to combine already existing disciplines and by so doing, strengthen them we should instead refuse the intellectual and political relevance of social sciences, structures of knowledge that reflect the social reality of the long 19th century. Otherwise, we would continue to work in structures of knowledge that are confused, conservative, and intellectually not very useful. This is certainly not a prudent way to approach a world social situation that is itself undergoing violent transition. The question seemed to be not the social science and university system <coughs> me, is going to be reorganized, but how and by whom? From the top or from below? This new project be predicted on epistemic reconciliation of science and philosophy. The world of knowledge could be reunited as a project that brings together research of truth and search for a just and good life. I do not think that it is enough to state that the world system is in the state of, of chaotic, I would say, rather chaotic transition. In order to create intellectually and politically more useful structures of knowledge, we need to unthink the epistemological assumptions we are using and build new systems of knowledge. This is our task and our responsibility. A restructuring of doctoral studies programs, for instance, into schools of doctoral studies would enable a more efficient and research-wise a more th thorough potential for scientific educational advancement. The aim of such a strategy of restructuring would be to release the research vision from its present excessive entrenchment within the limits of particular academic fields. Whereas once the paradigm of the fruits of productivity occurring from the very craft of specialization brought about the unquestionable superiority and global supremacy to the 
Western, of course, scientific thought, we are now undergoing a paradigm shift which takes us off into a world in which it is rather the all-embracing and the holistic approach to the research which offer the most becoming responses to the challenges raised in the now global and indivisible research community made ever more instantaneous and homogeneous by the digital universe in which we all operate. It is precisely for these reasons, just one sentence more, it is precisely for these reasons soundly grounded in the realm of theoretical premises that we propose the establishment of the schools of doctoral studies, which would offer a research and educational venue attuned to the challenges of science and its world view in the 21st century. The outcome of the proposal strategy of restructuring, I have no, two minutes. One and a half minutes. One, okay, I'll make it, sh okay. I'll make it short <laughs> within my own constringency. <laughs> Shakespearean. The outcome of the proposal strategy of restructuring of the present programs would be well-rounded doctoral dissertations held by an array of experts from different fields availing of an opportunity of addressing the research task from an adequate multitude of aspects transgressing, that's your word, <coughs> any boundaries traditionally posed in front of any serious research in the, w in the field of humanities and <coughs> social sciences. Firstly, at the level of, I have three points. Uh, firstly, at the level of single university, it would facilitate the pooling of the most competent members of the research and teaching staff to one establishment. Secondly, the school encompassing all the previously described attributes could be restructured, or could be structured so as to include professors and research students from select universities within the whole country. Thirdly, enabling a high quality coverage of a wide range of topical issues in humanities and social studies, which merit urgent research and advancement of the current state of knowledge, it could be established as a regional and international institution offering services to national, regional, and international research students and doctoral candidates. These, I'm coming to the end, this three-level formation of the, yes, there are three, three-level formations, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've given us a, an agenda for effective and relevant learning at the PhD level. Um, should we take a couple of questions? Uh, how does everybody feel? We should, we should propose at the that. End, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. I don't like to put them at the end, but if everybody seems to agree, then I shall move on to the next speaker in line. Vladka, oh, sorry, it's not. Blagoj Paunovic. Who was Yes, I was. I was oh. Would you like to join? Uh, yeah, Why please. Don't you take my no, 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 please. Do. It's, I, I need to take notes because I need to report back. Yeah. I don't know with, with what my energy, but <laughs> so your name is somewhere, and you will be. Oh, we didn't have the title for you, so you will tell this us is your title. It's okay. It does. It does. It does. It does matter. Ten minutes starts. Next. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, um, distinguished colleagues, uh, I would start uh, my my short presentation, my contribution to to this panel, with the well uh, well known uh, taxonomy of uh, Benjamin Samuel Bloom. Uh, it's well known that according to his tech taxonomy, uh, conceptual knowledge is one of the four levels of knowledge. Include uh, study or relationship between uh, uh, basic elements within a large structure that, can, that enables them to function as a whole. Elements of uh, conceptual knowledge uh, 
for example, are the following things, the knowledge of uh, uh, categories and classification, uh, um, principles and generalization, theories, uh, models and structures, and so on. But what is the point important is that uh, contextual knowledge and the receive education is, assumes that there is a target concept, concept of what and for whom the knowledge has the functional value. Uh, effective learning and generally learning uh, always have a, a content and outcome. Thus, when we are trying to, uh, we are seeking to the answer of the question, what is effective learning? We should start from the uh, necessary knowledge of the future generations. Uh, 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 speaking about content, uh, we always have in mind what, what uh, in how curriculum should be. In addition to the content, modern understanding of the learning emphasizes the importance of the outcome, which is the basis for uh, measuring, uh, monitoring, and evaluation of the learning process. When we talk about education, we always think about educations of, or education of future generations. The fourth industrial revolution greatly shapes the present and we will considerably influence the knowledge that future generations need to have. In uh, fourth industrial revolutions, all economic systems are transforming. Uh, com companies, national economies, uh, even the entire societies undergo fundamental changes. Therefore, uh, consequently, competition is less and less based on the costs and more on the uh, fun functionality, uh, innovation, and so on. Mass production economy with its low average cost will not in the future uh, provide competitive age as is used to do. The most valuable resource, the most important resource will be not won't be uh, traditional concept of capital but but uh, the talent. In the fourth industrial revolution, Employment pattern is changing with expansion of artificially based uh, automation. Even jobs will be created by themselves through innovative ecosystems. Thus, key priority should be to transform uh, education system to the requirements of the fourth industrial revolution. The emphasizes should be on creativity, developing creativity, that is the methods that boost creativity and remove obstacles to creativity. Critical thinking also is very important, digital literacy, developing capacity for empathy also is very important, teamwork, et, et cetera. Uh, effective learning does not mean accumulating facts, information. Effective learning should enable information to be linked according logical or consistent criteria in a meaningful way. Accordingly, effective learning should enable acquisition of certain conceptual knowledge that is theoretical, certain theoretical, and certain professional knowledge. But in addition, for learning to be effective, it should enable application of the knowledge. That also means that it should enable acquisition of certain applied knowledge and also encourage development of skills. For each profession, 
there is a, a certain combination of the knowledge. Relative presence of different knowledges, knowledges depends on the uh, profession for, for which students are educated as well as the level of the, of the education. As I said, as I mentioned, for each profession there is a certain uh, combination of the knowledge. For example, <coughs> effective entrepreneurial knowledge assumes a uh, appropriate combination of some theoretical, professional, and applied knowledge. Theoretical uh, knowledge for, uh, for the entrepreneurs are, for example, uh, the knowledge of the law of the market, the knowledge of the law of the competition, knowledge of the uh, regulatory environment, etc. Professional knowledge is mostly technical knowledge necessary for operating business ventures. Also, professional knowledge is a knowledge of the principles of the management, marketing, finance, business finance, accounting, and so on. But uh, entrepreneurial uh, education also should encourage development of some skills, such as leadership skill, negotiation skill, communication skill, and so on. The connections between these different, mm. one minute. The connection between uh, different uh, kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, knowledge is provided by using uh, innovative learning methods, such as integrative teaching, project teaching and interactive teaching. Integrative teaching is a teaching in which boundaries between different disciplines are deleted or vague and in which new meaningful connections are made between, between uh, uh, similar aspects of different disciplines. In that way, uh, perspectives of different dif differences are integrated in a new whole which is the larger and most important than Okay, thank you very Sorry, much. I, know, okay. do, I know you had a, a long video. I'm a grateful um, role. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, you're, okay. you're welcome. Right. We are now moving on to Janani. Are you ready and yes. ready to move on to your 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Then the floor is yours and I shall. Okay. Thank you, Olivia. Good afternoon. Those of us who've read uh, Shakespeare or who have studied uh, the history of England will be familiar with the story of King Henry V. I'm going to narrate a, a brief event from his life. The King Henry V and, and 6,000 of his soldiers uh, were in France fighting. This was part of the Hundred Year War between England and France. And uh, the soldiers, all these men had been marching continuously for two weeks. They were all tired, hungry, sick. They didn't have enough weapons. And they faced a French army that was uh, well rested, well equipped. They were all so confident. And mainly, they outnumbered the English by five to one. And one English general, he said, oh, if we had a few more men on our side, and the king hears this and he says, uh, no, don't wish for one man more because the fewer we are, the greater each person's share of the glory. And we will all remember this day very proudly. We will show our scars to our children and grandchildren when we tell them about this day. And he motivates all his men. He speaks to them so enthusiastically. He says, today we are, a, we are all brothers and we band of brothers will win today. And actually, they go on to win. Nobody expected this. The French did not expect this. The English did, themselves did not expect this. And then they go on to win. And this speech, uh, the speech at uh, the Battle of Agincourt, was uh, immortalized by Shakespeare in his play, King Henry V. And this is something that we teach, this play, in our schools and colleges in different countries where uh, English languages start. 
Why do we actually teach this though? Why do we teach Shakespeare today? It's not to learn English, it's not to teach English. We don't speak that English anymore, not in England, not anywhere in the world. It is taught in schools, in colleges, but not just that. It is even taught in military academies where soldiers are trained in leadership. The speech was played on Allied ships when they were crossing to land in Normandy during Second World War. The same speech is played by, uh, in the locker uh, um, rooms by, by football coaches when it looks like uh, the team is about to lose during halftime. And uh, it's actually used as a case study in MBA in, in American universities. The same speech is actually used in, ex uh, in, in training executives in companies because this shows the power of the human subjective emotional factor in determining the results. When I am emotionally invested in something, I work in a way that I, I simply cannot when I'm not interested in this. And uh, this is something that is known by, by all sports people, by all athletes. The way they feel when they are about to start the race or start the game determines the result. Every army general knows this. Tolstoy called it the spirit of the army. And uh, this is... Uh, something that is taught, that can be taught even to the students when we teach them Shakespeare, when we teach them any story, the power of the subjective, that the numbers do not matter. It does not matter that they outnumber us five to one. We are so few in number. And uh, this idea that the numbers do not matter, we see again in daily life. Uh, if you even take the example of the tech giant Apple, it, it, in the mid-90s, it looked like uh, the company was failing. All the industry experts said, no, the company has no future. The media had written it off. Even all the rival companies, they were all uh, very certain. The, the CEO of uh, Dell Computers, he said, I have a piece of advice. It is better that the board uh, liquidates the stocks, repay all the shareholders, and, and they close down the company because there is no other future. But they did not take into account the creative genius of the, the CEO of, of Steve Jobs, who, who's, who realized that actually people are still scared of the machine. They think, oh, the machine will rule us. And he was able to package, to image the computer in such a way that he was able to tell them, this is only a tool to serve you. And that turned around the company. He was able to do it because he understood he, he understood that the, the numbers on the balance sheet actually do not matter. He understood the psychology of the people. This is exactly what King Henry V also understood. And if we can show the students, what you are learning in a story, in a play of Shakespeare, can be applied in anything, even in a company if you work. When we were able to show them this, the, the, the power of the idea, uh, the, the king, when he speaks to his soldiers, he says, uh, today we are all brothers in a society that is so steeped in class consciousness. When he says, every one of you soldiers my, is my brother, how will a soldier fight when he believes that he's fighting for his, for, for his salary? And how does he fight when he believes that uh, he is fighting for his brother's or his family throne? It, it makes a difference. And he was able to understand the same psychology and the power of the idea that comes out in this. This has been applied successfully throughout history. We see uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he said, uh, when he told all the Indians, let us all make salt. What is said? He was trying to get independence for the country from a colonial power and, and a salt tax had been imposed. So what did Gandhi say? He said, uh, let us all go to the seacoast. We have a 7,000 kilometer seacoast in India. Let us all go and let us all make salt. And this symbol act, this, this symbolic act, was able to actually uh, gather all this, this aspiration for freedom and make it one force that acted against uh, the rulers and it got India independence. The same idea that Martin Luther King Jr. he applied when he said, uh, let us all boycott the government buses and just walk. That was a simple idea, one man, one idea. And with this, he was able to inspire the country. He got attention from the whole world. And he was able to um, implement, uh, make legislation possible that ended uh, racial segregation in the country, the act. What he started may still not be over, but he was able to create a revolution. One person, one idea. The same thing that we see in the Pakistani girl, Malala, who said, I am going to school. That is all she said. 
and she's created a movement and 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 uh, Greta Thunberg she said just the opposite she said I am not going to school and she asked everybody else to join in and this one person one idea and the power that it has to create a revolution this we can see we can show the students that the same idea is there even in uh, this play by uh, Shakespeare so I just use this play as an illustration to illustrate this point that you can take any story, you can take any work of literature, you can take any subject, and from this, it is possible to derive the essence of knowledge, of accomplishment that can be transferred, that can be applied in any field by anybody. And uh, because isn't that what we're trying to create? People who can think across disciplines. If you look at any problem that we have today, it is created because uh, we did not think outside our boundary. In India, we have so many engineering colleges that produce tens of thousands of engineers. One more minute? OK. Uh, uh, thousands of engineers who are so good at their work at, say, civil construction, at constructing dams, and they, 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 they can make these perfect plans without a thought to the, the, the lands that will be flooded, the villages that will have to be evacuated, the people who are connected to, emotionally connected to these places, and to the livelihoods that are based on these regions. Without a thought, they can create perfect plans in our engineering colleges. So in order to prevent this, when we can show students how one subject relates to everything else, the knowledge that we get can be transferred in any field that we work. We create people who can think in an integrated way. Thank you. I need a video here. session will summarize a very long research and more than 30 years this was concentrated on the question what knowledge do we need in order to maximize and upgrade our speech behavior we summarized it in a video that will give the whole knowledge we know the whole knowledge we need in order but we don't hear anything promising. That's what I offered, but she said no. No, no. It wasn't planned. It was not what you just said. It was the, the point that came up. So, 
זה לא טוב. גם לא שומעים ולא נראים. Would you like to restart it, maybe? <laughs> well, I don't know. You were, you were. She seems to not think that that's working. And now it's working. Yes, it's working. Great. Put it. It's not connected to the Ramco. functions are invisible. Two inherent mechanisms in the human brain. Lower mechanism to activate the primitive functions. The mini brain. Higher mechanism for advanced human functions. The super mind. Lower are fast and automatic. They activate the mini minds and switch off and disconnect the executive mind. The result is hurtful speech. The mini mind, the super mind, and in between. Welcome to Ethic Talk Technology to realize your full potential. For that, you must receive new knowledge about speech as a mirror of the mind and heart. Speech as the mirror of the mind and heart. Brain and heart functions are invisible. Two inherent mechanisms in the human brain. Lower mechanism to activate primitive functions, the mini-mind. And a higher mechanism for advanced human functions, the supermind. Lower mechanisms are fast and automatic. They activate the mini-minds and switch off and disconnect the executive mind. The result is hurtful speech. The mini-mind, the supermind, and in between. The connection between the mind and the laws of nature is hidden from view. The mini and supermind functions are affected by environmental cues from the surrounding world, nature laws. Offensive speech indicates that mind and heart are desynchronized from those environment signals. Ethic Talk technology accompanies you to facilitate that synchronization in order to realize your full human intelligence. Please note, an important role of speech is to help you overcome a brain barrier you are not aware of. Conscious thinking and speech are your first step to freedom. Quality of speech and social interactions. Connection or disconnection to environmental cues regulate the quality of speech and the levels of human potential. Human intelligence, 100% human potential. One level of disconnection Thinking and conscious speech, 89% of human potential. Two levels of disconnection, inconsistent, sometimes unconscious speech, 75% human potential. Three levels of disconnection, automatic domineering, unaware speech, 51% of human potential. Four levels of disconnection, Automatic, over-pleasing, unaware speech, 26% of human potential. Five levels of disconnection. Automatic, accusatory, unaware speech, 24% of human potential. Six levels of disconnection. Automatic, aggressive, unaware speech, 21% of human potential. Feeling unrest. Stuck. Sad, angry, stressed, bad mood. In order to help you realize your potential, we require three voice samples. 
Focus on the unrest you're feeling now throughout the recording. Keep pressing the blue mic while saying ah until the end of the cycle. Say ah. Thank you. The recording was successful. Rate your current level of feelings from 1 to 10. Discover the mini mind that activates you now. Overbearing judgmental speech. Overpleasing flattering speech. Accusatory speech. Aggressive speech. If you selected aggressive speech, you are at six degrees of disconnection from the super mind and heart. What is the reason for the aggressive speech? At six degrees of disconnection from the super mind and heart, you only realize 21% of your human potential. The red mini mind arouses fears and anxiety and is revealed in automatic, aggressive and hurtful speech. In order to block the automatic speech, you need to activate the switch. How to connect to the human mechanism. Press your tongue to the roof of the mouth in order to help the switch block the automatic, aggressive and hurtful speech. Don't attack. That is the way to disconnect from the automatic mechanism. Move your eyes four times from right to left and back. Take three deep breaths and slowly exhale the aggressive energy. Ask yourself, what is the solution? Watch for inner changes. When the switch is activated, you feel stress relief, a gradual shift to serenity, well-being and calmer breathing. Now, wait until you have the proper knowledge how to react or not react and solve the problem. The human mechanism can also react with aggression, but only as a means for settling failed relationships. Try and think about the result. Is it right for you to react or not? Result number two, the degree of connection or disconnection from conscious thinking and talking has been measured. Your result, before, after, you have successfully completed the process. Try to use ethic talk as frequently as possible. Your goal, full human intelligence. Good luck. New insight. The reason for our difficulties. Collective disconnect from the living environment, the laws of nature, the supermind and the heart is the cause of automatic negative emotions, misunderstandings, conflicts and violence threatening our quality of life and future existence. The personal and collective solution. Collective connectivity to the living environment, the supermind and the heart guarantees our enlightened and sublime personal and collective existence. We all depend on collective connectivity. Each person who is disconnected from the supermind, the environment and the heart makes it difficult for himself and others. Each person who is connected makes it easier for himself and others. Get started now. Disconnect and block the automatic mechanism. Good luck to us all. Ethic Talk. Okay. Welcome to Ethic Talk Technology to realize your full potential. For that, you must receive new
or doubts if anybody has the energy to muster and can remember what we talked about. Yes, uh, I'm exceptionally excited to, uh, th I'm, I'm yellow. It's for yeah. the register, yeah. Because I feel it's gonna be too loud. I'm exceptionally excited for what I've experienced with Leora's um, uh, four minute video. And first I'm thinking immediately, self-reflecting on my own behavior, um, it situates me in, in, in this self-reflective state. Then I'm thinking about my own children or people I interact with, any relations that I have. And I certainly wish that on my home country here as well as my resident country of America, if we only paused every day to remind ourselves of this practice, uh, we would really truly transform the entire world. And that uh, to begin from ourselves and all the relations, to start thinking in that kind of co-evolving way, with that kind of empathy, with that kind of sensitivity to the actions and reactions that we have in the world. Just to be in that state of mind and heart is enough already to prevent us from acting incorrectly or hurtfully, let alone to um, inspire us to act ethically, to act empathetically, and to speak that way. So I'm, I'm exceptionally excited because it, it, we have a tendency to overanalyze and not have practical ways to apply this in classroom, in boardrooms, and also um, typically not to self-reflect on us as administrators in universities or schools as teachers. This entire day I've heard brilliant concepts about how either something is wrong with our system, which we apparently we have agreed that it's old, so we don't want to inhabit it anymore, we're trying to step into the new system, but it's the, the sa exact same thing as if we were to try to take the exact same mentality and consciousness onto Mars. Good luck, we'll explode the entire solar system. It doesn't matter. So I'm superbly excited that you've offered us something that turns us into our own teachers, instruments, and testimonies to transformation. Thank you, Milav. Yes. Thank you. D would you like to comment on that or we'll, we'll hold and collect some questions and the lady please thank you thank you I also have a question for you can you say something as to the model behind it how what what made you lead or decide about upon those various levels what went into there uh, and the second part of the question is, how do you recommend using it? Because what I find uh, uh, it very difficult is if I have to think about this, then it's already too late. How can we, no. how can we automatize? For instance, I've been sitting on my cushion for 50, uh, 40 years. I meditate every day for two hours. And the result is, you know, like a automatic b behavior, so it, it, it does something to me. How can I use this to get to the same? You can do all the, all it's, it suits all the, others, uh, uh, the other technologies. It's good for meditation and for yoga, everything. But then to, uh, check it by your speech behavior and the result. You know, all the systems wants to, to overcome this barrier in the mind. And speech gives us the, the real uh, knowledge if something really changed. Because you can feel better with other things. The, the, the speech, the, no, the most important thing is, it, uh, is to understand here that this gives us the, the real uh, knowledge if we are connected or disconnected to the environment, to the super mind, and to the heart. Be uh, this is our regulation, it's our new regulation. I understand, uh, that was not my, my question. Ah, what is that? You're talking about the result, I'm talking about the, how do I get there? When do you, you when do you use it? You do it when you feel yeah, bad. How, do you how, to how do you apply it? How do you really? If you have a problem, you don't know how to solve it, and you feel unconscious, you feel 
uh, unpleasant, you are nervous, you all, all the ask the, the, you take it in the time it's good for you because each one has the telephone always with him. And you are working with yourself, all the knowledge, you get feedback, it's only for you. And when you, you will feel, if you feel better, and you are trying to solve the problem, and you solve the problem, and you change the relations and your feeling, it means that you move. And you, you are doing it very fast. And I've seen that after a short time, not a last time, it is becoming a habit. I'm teaching in 20 years, children from the age of four. I must say, for years, I said, I always said, I'm bringing something new, but it is something that is inborn, and you don't know that you know it. You don't know that you know it. And that's why it's going so fast. I taught it on the MA program in mediation, in law school, in education school, in media school to analyze the media and the films and so on. And now it's, a, it's the main course to um, uh, 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 managing in the, in, in, in the okay. Management. Management. Yeah. Yeah. However, it's going very fast because we give an idea that each one of us knows it, and after he's practicing, they are, each one is doing very big changes. We did it on a whole city. Children with the highest levels of problems they had the highest level of progressing. Because suddenly, we showed them something that they can improve themselves so simply. Mm -hmm. And they came and they said, my teacher is much worse than I am. He is reacting in such a terrible way <laughs> that I can't stand his lesson because he's bringing me back to my mini minds. What so I'm not your going scale? to his lessons. What informed your scale? What Ah, the scale, this is a linguistic, okay. It's a long uh, uh, answer. After we found this switch, the methodology, uh, I started, as I am a linguistic, I started to analyze everything of my uh, no, new knowledge about speech, cognition, feelings, in the Bible, in the texts, in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the Quran, in the Buddhism, and in the I Ching. And I collected the knowledge about it. The Hebrew has a, a cosmology that the Hebrew letters are, have also uh, numbers. They are all their letters, but they have values in numbers. And in, in, the, in this cosmology, we know exactly the 10 levels of communication. And when you, you switch to them, uh, you, you, you know how how the, to measure it, and the same idea we found in the New Testament. I am the Aleph and the Taf, I am the Alpha and Omega. It's the same thing, and I show it, in, I, I can teach the same cosmology in all the way, during, uh, through uh, sciences, different uh, sciences, through the Bible, through the New Testament, through the Quran, through all that. And we found the common in all of them, and, that, and we found it right, because we are trying it for many years. It's a research with more than 30 years. Yeah. Yes, and then Gary, please. Th th thank you for uh, introducing a wonderful concept, actually. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, I'm getting some inner opening, actually, through this. No, I just, I have a straightforward question, you know, where you derived this concept of super mind. Ah. It's not me. I'm working with Dr. Ernesto Coleman. Dr. Ernesto Coleman is a, a neurolinguist, a biophysician. He, for in the 80s, he had the first company on the stock market called Ultramind. We are working together about 14 years. And this is the result of our uh, collaboration. collaboration and Professor Yuda Kahana that he is uh, interested in business and environment. He joined us because our knowledge about speech and environment. And we are working now together more than t two years in order to bring it as a technology that each one will be able to do it by himself. And I think of this uh, technology is that each one 
prove it by himself. We give him the, the uh, idea, and each one can rec see that he's, when he's moving, he's more relaxed, he feels better. On a certain point, the, the negative feelings are disappearing, and, uh, and the, the ability to solve problem is becoming higher and higher. Now, we are te teaching it in kindergartens, in many kindergartens, the children for the age of four, the parents and the, and the kindergarten. And they are talking in this way. You know, I must apologize. You know what happened? My red mini mine was uh, disconnected me from my uh, uh, super mine. And that's why I am behaving this way. But what I did, I disconnected the mini mine. And now I have the answer. So we have a, a common, new common language that is very easy to express your inner feeling. And children from the age of four, when we saw that they are, they are teaching their parents. Can I ask uh, Gary? Um, sure. for, is there any other question? No, so Gary, probably the last question. Just a quick comment and a quick comment and maybe a question to Jiminy. Uh, I think there's something very intuitive. There's something very intuitive about this, that we get lost in our reactions and we get lost in our justifications of those reactions, our provocations. And regardless of what the provocation is, you're asking us, switch the field from the provocation to the fact that of where I'm speaking from or where I'm reacting from. So you all automatically take one step back from being lost in the justification for our provocation. We change the field. We detach from it and follow a rule that whatever the provocation is, uh, we should respond from the highest level possible because that's the only thing that's going to yield a positive result for us. So I think there's something very intuitive behind all your research and very appealing as a method. Uh, just a quick comment and a question to Janani, a simple question. Uh, I think it's very interesting you gave examples from history and you gave example from literature. Uh, it's interesting as a reflection of how much we teach the history and the literature. We take the outer facts, we teach the outer facts, and we miss the real human insights that come from a human experience. We teach biography, we teach history with dates and places and facts and everything, but we miss the real kernel of it. So what you're saying, whether it's literature or history or anything else, uh, because our, our, our academia has become very positivistic, and whereas the thing that's really beneficial to us is to understand the human response and the power of that response. And my question is, I don't think you really told us the outcome. There's the historical battle, it, though Shakespeare romanticized it in his speeches, in, the, in Henry V, what was the out actual outcome of the battle? You told us who won, but you didn't really tell us the whole. <laughs> this was part of the Hundred Year War between the two countries. In this particular battle, the English won, and, and there were 6,000 of them, and then the French were 30,000. And on the English side, the casualty was around 100. Just a hundred, whereas on the French side, it, it went into, into thousands, 3,000 to 4,000 of the men um, died. And it was this battle which actually positioned England as the major power of Europe from then on. So this was the actual result of that historical battle, the Maybe fact. they were practicing Leora's breathing technique. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for the questions. Is there any other question? Yes. Ah, yes, please. Oh, gosh, two. No, My. Just on the question of this oh, um, sorry, yes. To the information about the dinner after yeah. <laughs> 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 
Thomas had a question. Thomas, is your question quick? Just yeah, before, yes. yeah. Um, Can I have, get I the question and then? Say, um, I don't really know enough about this system. There are so many others that are very sophisticated systems. For example, uh, for anger management, mm -hmm. yeah, very sophisticated systems, um, and also I'm, I'm not so sure how easy it is to necessarily operationalize Shakespeare's insight for all fields. But the one thing I wanted to say is that when education begins, <coughs> children, uh, even preschool children, are to a large extent already psychologically formed. And I think that's something that is really important to realize. Mm. The education or the, 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 the conditioning that occurs before any formal education begins. And in a way, education comes after the fact. You know, the formative years are already over in many ways. And I I'm not saying that uh, that kind of education should be taken away from the family. I think it, it should be there, but there isn't much education in parenting. And that's, I think, something we could look at. You know, how do you... Uh, where are people educated to be good parents so that they uh, can ensure their children grow <laughs> up in a st into a state of psychological health so they do not need um, this kind of treatment or reflection that they're spontaneously already uh, ready to, to act from their higher mind or in, in a considered, compassionate manner? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but I, I do want to let everybody have a break before dinner. And we are now about to find out more yeah, about dinner. Order, order. <laughs> so, so where, so it's at the national. So, as eight o'clock, yes. we will be in front of the hotel, me and my partner, Chloe, so you're an invitation. Okay. And we will take you to the National Museum, where we will have the. Um, Concert, the and then the dinner, which will be standing buffet. Wonderful. And all that will happen at what time? What time should we be at the, lo at the lobby of the hotel? Mm. At 8. Okay. Okay, so. Right. Hours and hours. <laughs> And after a whole day of being talked at, I am sure you'll be delighted to listen to something different. Yes. So thank you very much, everyone, for the resilience. Yeah, and see you tonight. Uh.